think that was a, I really like the fact that I've, I'm speaking after you because I, I can pick up on a lot of those threads because this is what I've got really interested in. Uh, I started my field work, I did my field work on this a few years ago and did uh, in-depth interviews and online surveys. But it's as I've gone on from that and I've started to look at, go beyond looking at the data and try and think about what the data means theoretically, that I've started to get really interested in this idea of firstly sexual culture and what you can learn about sexual culture by the way in which people interpret and respond to asexuality. Because in the three years I've been doing this research, when people ask me, what do you do research on, and I say asexuality, that inevitably sparks a much longer conversation than it does if I mention my other research, um, which is relatively obscure. And it's really interesting, because people, they get asexuality and they, they don't, and I fell into that category as well when I first encountered it. That people have an idea of what the word means, but they don't really follow what it would mean for someone to be asexual. People who've not <coughs> encountered it as a term, as a self-identity, will often intuitively understand what the term would mean, but not really understand the consequences that would flow from it for the kind of person someone is. And I think a lot of this comes down to the question of standards about what is sexual and what is sexual enough. And this is the second time in a row that I've spoken about this and was struck by how interesting I found the person speaking beforehand. Um, and the, the last time this happened was in uh, Manchester, Critical Sex Holiday with Mercedes, who's speaking next, where the presenters before me uh, talked about their findings from a project which looked at many aspects, but um, sexual experience in particular of same-sex uh, civil, civil partnered couples. And the extent to which people reported the fear that uh, you know, sexual desire was diminishing, that they weren't sexual enough as something which actually had quite a negative impact on the relationship. And it struck me how this is something that emerges again and again across a whole range of areas. It seems that the space of what is properly sexual, what is correctly sexual, seems in a way to be narrowing. Um, and I don't think this is something that's always happened. I think this is actually historically and culturally a relatively recent phenomena. And because it's such an everyday part of our lives, it can be easy to lose track of the, the, real, the knowledge about quite how much sexual culture has changed in a relatively short space of time. And some of this comes down to the sexual revolution in the 1960s, although I don't, I don't like the term very much, and I think it's a misleading term. But there's a lot of other factors involved as well, and in the space of 60 years, the way in which we think, um, feel and experience sex and sexual attraction, sexual desire, has changed radically, but in, we've also we talk much more about it, there's an openness and visibility to it which previously just couldn't have been imagined, but I don't think we've actually become more understanding about what it is and what it means for us. I think, in a way, we've become more outspoken and more confused at the same time. We're loud and vocal in Western capitalist societies about sex and sexual desire, but also fundamentally kind of inarticulate. We try and express the most intimate aspects of human experience in terms of concepts which are fundamentally very restrictive. And it's since I've been doing the asexuality research that I've started to look at some of the ideas that we take as um, common sense about what sexual desire is. Like the, the idea of a sex drive, for instance, I'd assume everyone in this room, if I asked you, do you know what the idea of a sex drive means? You'd say yes, at least to some extent. And yet, I think we know how the term like that is used, we know how the concept's used, but I don't think, I, the more I thought about it, the more I don't know what a sex drive is. I don't know what a sex drive is supposed to correspond to as an explanation of how people work. And the closest I've come to actually getting a concrete explanation of this is people who are quite hardcore biological reductionists who say sex drive is just some sort of hormonal process. Because to say that people have sexual desire because they have sex drive isn't actually an explanation. Because what is a sex drive if it's something called a sexual desire? Do you see what I mean? It's, uh, it's an everyday concept which I think we don't really question. And I'm getting to the end of my PhD now and I'm trying to plan for the work I want to do afterwards, which is to try and look historically at the discipline of sexology. Um, so as people became, as talk about sex became much more 
visible, sexuality became much more visible, and I think you can't underestimate the extent to which consumer capitalism played a role in this, because at the same time as Western economies increasingly focused on having to sell consumer goods, the fact that people were, for good reasons, more open, less prudish about sex, was something that effectively could be exploited, and this isn't a conspiracy theory, this is just saying that this is what, how advertising developed, although at this stage I'm basing that more on having watched Mad Men than actually having studies. Uh, anything about advertising in the 60s. And so, the, uh, the, the idea of someone worrying about not being sexual enough, again, it's one of those things that someone could describe that, and we probably all understand at least to some extent the worry that they're expressing. You know, what the fear is that they're expressing, why this is an anxiety for them. But, Moving beyond that kind of understanding the feeling they're expressing, what does it mean for them to say that they're worried they're not sexual enough? What is the actual standard that people are perceiving themselves as falling short of? Where did it come from? How did it develop? How has it changed? Because I think we're more, much more likely to be critically reflective. <coughs> I think there's been a whole host of changes, which is where my other branch of research comes in, about how we relate to ourselves, but how we relate to our own objective properties as beings. Um, over the course of modernity, over the course of the last 50 years. And we're much more likely to stand back from ourselves and diagnose ourselves, to look as, upon ourselves as objects and evaluate our proper or improper functioning. And I think there's a whole host of unexamined and largely unargued for assumptions, which at this stage I can't justify because I've not done this planned research project yet. But I suspect it comes largely from sexology that all these sometimes pseudo-scientific discipline and some legitimate scientific aspects of it. Although the, the concepts have been lost to, although some of the concepts have been scientifically discredited, not scientifically used, the hypothesis that I want to explore is that the, the sort of conceptual architecture, the sets of theoretical assumptions that these early sexologists made, because of, among other things, media coverage and where people started to write about sex in the media and talk about sex in the media for the first time, some of these concepts, which I don't think were very good to begin with, permeated out from their scientific context and into everyday life, where they became much worse and much more fragmented. And today, just in terms of the particular issue of relationships, um, asexual relationships, uh, I wanted to explore what I take to be the, I don't like the term master concept, but what I think is at the core of a lot of our thinking about sex and sexuality, and yet is largely undiagnosed, which is what I term the sexual assumption. The idea that sexual attraction is something that's universal, and that is something that's uniform, that when we talk about sexual attraction, we mean fundamentally the same thing. You know, in some cases, we often see this as something that's on a, uh, that could be placed on a scale, or a gradient. So, people will talk about more or less attraction, they'll weigh up two different experiences of sexual attraction. And I think that sense of its uniformity is something which is really questionable, because when you do in-depth research and try and talk to people about these experiences, you realise that most people seem to have had the experience of trying to articulate intimate or sexual experience, and finding that the words, the concepts available to them, the conceptual tools they have to express these thoughts, or inadequate, that they don't adequately capture, adequately express the actual lived reality. And in terms of the universe, like the assumption of um, the universality of sexual attraction, I mean, this is how I first got interested in asexuality as a research topic, because it's obviously not true. You know, the fact that there is an asexual community, uh, the full extent of which is still largely unknown, because although visibility of asexuality has improved a lot, there's still a long, long way to go. And the, the sketchy statistics we have suggest that, up to, and they are sketchy, but suggest that up to more percent of the population could be asexual. And so sexual attraction isn't universal. I don't think it's uniform, and when I first came across asexuality, I just spent a summer writing an MA dissertation, reading lots and lots of books about sexual identity, and then was instantly struck by the fact that every single one of them had assumed that sexual identity went hand in hand with sexual attraction, and that everyone had it which I think manifestly isn't true. And so, I think the experience of asexual individuals, um, romantic asexuals, um, in 
relationships is a very interesting way to look at the restrictiveness of some of these concepts that we have available to us because, at least in my experience, even if we're not asexual, the concepts we have available to us are still restrictive, they still restrain us. It's just that when we do experience sex attraction in some form, it becomes a lot harder to critically step back and try and articulate why these concepts are inadequate for the purposes we're using them for. Whereas because there is that repudiation of the sexual assumption in the experience of asexual individuals, it's easier to take that critical step back if you're looking at <coughs> people's experiences or reports of their experience. And one of the first interviews I did, the respondent said something that stuck with me, uh, that I don't necessarily know the line between a really strong friendship and a crush. And as I said, I'm not asexual, but I've had that experience many, many times in my life, where we're trying to impose an actual lived experience, a lived re relational experience, and we're trying to impose on it this very binary category that doesn't really capture it, where there's a sharp dividing line, and something will either fall into one category or the other. Uh, and Kristen Scherer, who's probably my favourite person who's written on asexuality, talks about this in terms of her finding that for several participants, binary relation relationship categories, such as single and taker, or friendship and intimate, felt false. And she says several participants, which I didn't really understand, because I, I find that was true of almost everyone I spoke to about these issues. And I think it's because the whole category of romantic partner is something which is anchored through a reciprocal commitment, a commitment on both sides, albeit not one that's necessarily honoured, um, to sexual monogamy. And that once this kind of sexual intimacy is out of the picture, the whole concept of a romantic partner, it still makes sense, it's still something we can understand and apply, but it, it kind of becomes de-anchored. It becomes a bit fuzzy and it becomes difficult to understand how it can be applied to experience. Because uh, James, an asexual man in his 30s, said to me in an interview, and asked, is an asexual relationship the same as any other relationship, except you don't have sex? Or is it more like two housemates sharing a house together and being good friends? Because they're quite different extremes. And I took him to be saying that these are two extreme ends of the spectrum which asexual relationships could fall on. And the range of possibilities about how the relationship actually works on a day-to-day -day level falls somewhere in between the two. And as he put it, the asexual relationships are so much more open in terms of what each person could be expecting. analysis of this, Sherry talks about the limitations of language to describe the range of possible relationships. And I, as I said, I mean, I, I'm not sure how clearly it's come across. Uh, and if you have had, you get what she and I are both referring to. Because when I first read Sherry's work on this, you know, I realised I've had this experience many, many, many times. And in fact, I think it's a very hard to articulate, from, from a theoretical standpoint, it's a very hard to articulate dimension of what it is to be human but one that is crucial to who we are and how we grow and how we change and the people we become. This gap between what we're trying to express, what we feel, and the actual concepts, um, the ideas, the terms available to us, through which it's not just a case of expressing it to others, it's a case of expressing it to ourselves. We have internal conversations as well as external ones. And both of those use concepts that we do not ourselves choose. And these concepts, they enable they allow us to say things, they allow us to articulate things internally into external others which otherwise we couldn't. But they also restrain, they restrict what we can express. And in both senses of uh, things internally and things to external others, this shapes our lives in a whole host of ways, but one of the most crucial is just giving an account of ourselves, you know, giving, articulating our sense of who we are and who we could be, who we want to be. And the concepts we have available to us can place great restrictions on that process, and I think no, none more readily than in the area of intimacy and in relationships. And so I, I think there's a tension between this moment of productive tension between the constraints of these relational concepts and the, uh, the experiences that are trying to be expressed through them. But Shara just seems to see this as something that's descriptive, that there's an experience and then there are not the terms necessary to adequately, accurately describe that experience. And this is where I part company with her, although I, this is probably my favourite bit of work that's ever been done on asexuality.
Um, because I, I think she's right that there is that kind of descriptive moment where we draw on these terms to actually articulate something that's already there. But there's a, there's a transformative moment as well, because when we start to articulate something, be it just about ourselves internally, or particularly in the context of relationships, there are always things that are left tacit, there are things that are left unsaid, and they can really shape the unfolding of a relationship. Sorry, my cold's starting to kick in. And so when you take understandings that are tacit and you, you render them explicit, you articulate them, this isn't just reflecting something that was already there. It creates a space between the two partners, or three partners, or many partners, in a relationship. And it changes the objective facts of what that relationship is. It becomes a context that people on both sides take for granted, that it becomes part of their day-to-day -day life. And so when you take nameless experiences, give them names, and this the process of, through articulation, things that are private, things that are tacit and unsaid, became, become public um, and known, and they become things that both sides can take for granted, and that they work with it, it shapes what their relationship is to them. And so, as I said, I think there is this descriptive element to the how the relational concepts we have fit with our experience, but there's also this transformative moment because as the as the relational concepts we have evolve and change, and I think they change have been changing throughout history. There's a sense in which it literally becomes possible to be with others in new ways, to relate to others in ways that change that experience. New ways of being intimate with other people in all senses of intimacy become feasible as the categories we have that we apply to that intimacy expand and grow. And the you know there's a historical, geographical, cultural variability to relational categories. And they have always been changing throughout history. And I think that in the last 60 years, the speed at which they're changing has started to increase rapidly. And so, Jeffrey, I think it's Jeffrey Weeks, talks about the everyday experiments in living in um, LGBT and queer communities. And I see this gap between experience and language as being at the heart of what these everyday experiments are, that people struggle against the limits of language to describe the emotional intimate realities they experience, and through doing so they make new realities possible. And this isn't just a personal thing, because pe um, people talk to each other. And this is why I found the asexual community so fascinating, that although there is this umbrella definition, the umbrella term, once I started to get into the fieldwork, I realised quite how much diversity there is beneath, behind, beneath the surface. And the extent to which this new, vocab new vocabulary, this new terminology was being constantly generated through these dialogues about people's experiences and the ways in which the terms that were locally available to them weren't adequate to describe who they took themselves to be. And I think this has um, significance you know, for people who aren't asexual. Because I think much as the, I'd argue that the LGBT movement and the widespread visibility of it, it, in a whole host of ways, made the world a more sexually tolerant place. And impartially, you know, unevenly, made the world a better place for straight people to be straight in. Similarly, I think that an increased visibility for the asexual community could have a really big impact on, and this is why I don't know what term to use, because I, I veer between saying non-asexuals and sexuals. It's not actually a good word for people who are not asexual. Because if asexuality is itself defined linguistically as a negation, then to say non-asexuals are we saying a negation of a negation. And I, I, I think there's a rigidity to our sexual, the, the sort of conceptual architecture of sexual culture, which, not just in the asexual community, but I think most emphatically within it, is starting to be broken apart. And I, I think the way in which we think about uh, intimate life, and there's lots of scholars in family studies and sexuality studies who, from different directions, are starting to say the same thing. Uh, that the way in which we think about intimate life is, I think, in the process of really radically changing. And across society, the gap between the concepts available to us and our actual experiences is getting larger. People are creatively responding to this. Uh, yeah, that's my talk. Thank you.
Thanks, Mark. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, you obviously brought sort of sexuality as the main focus. Yeah. And how, so I'm just kind of back in me somewhere. <laughs> No, I'm not going to try to do that. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you'll you'll yeah. disturb the screen, I'm afraid. Um, and you've talked about the expanding of categories of sex and not sex and what that means. But also, uh, have you done much research into sort of love and the way that love can be or is similarly wide in, in experience? And you can love someone one way, you can love another person another way, and it's not always split into romantic and non-romantic. Uh, yeah, it's actually that I thought. I've not really explored it systematically, but it's that connection that got me started mm -hmm. in the side of thought in the first place. Because uh, I, I did classes in Greek when I was at school and did some Greek philosophy in the past, and just started to think back to the idea of the different ways of dividing up categories of love in Greek thought and Greek life. And so, one of the things I want to do for my postdoc idea is to try and go back, and I'm not sure how I'll do this, but to look back through history and see these different ways in which people have divided up in different times and places, love and sex and intimacy. Because I think there's lots of... We, you know, we have this very mechanical way of looking at what sex is and the standards inherent in it, and the fact that the space at which people feel okay with themselves sexually, I think, is generally becoming narrower and narrower and narrower. And I don't think anyone's intending to do this, but I think there are all sorts of contradictions loaded into the way we think and talk about these issues, which is creating this tendency. And much as like you know the asexual community, despite not being asexual, the research has had a big impact on how I see myself and how I see my life in terms of looking at it in a whole new set of terms. I think similarly, it would be really interesting to look at this historically, um, because we you know we have this often have this assumption of um, continual progress as we get freer and more liberal and cleverer, and you know in some great ways that is very true. You know the world is much more tolerant. UK society, rather, is more, more tolerant than it was 50 years ago. But I think things have been lost at the same time. Did that answer the question? I hope that was a slight rumbling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you were saying that like, it's helping you to find like, an understanding of yourself and the way you think about sexuality, um, when in your research and the interviews, did you find a lot of people defining for themselves their own terms? So, if you gave them like a, a standard, what one word that, like you said, has this common sense approach to it, but then people are redefining that in terms of themselves, did you find that happening? Uh, but I recruited almost everyone who took part in the research. I found through the social community online, with a few exceptions, and I think perhaps because of this they all tended to describe themselves and their experiences in the terms that were common in the asexual community. So I find it really interesting if, you know, it's very difficult to find people but to talk to people who are just might not end up in the asexual community and see if they come up with their own terms. Um, because, you know, the way in which people talked about uh, just the very process of coming across the term asexual and that it wasn't that there's something wrong with them, it's just that there are people who are this way and that's fine. Um, and the extent that with that that allows a process of redescription, um, which people talked about, you know, in terms of like finally knowing where they fit into the world, finally knowing who they who they were. But I think there probably are lots of people who, biographically, their life hasn't led them to the asexual community, but they've had similar sorts of experiences. And from a research design standpoint, I have no idea how you find people like that, unless you've got an enormous grant and can do big random samples, because we don't know how many people are kind of proto-asexual, or people who might come to define themselves as asexual were they to hear of it. Or, you know, I encountered a few people that I met randomly for whom it was just a label rather than an identity. It was a description they came across. It wasn't something they saw at the part of themselves. It was just a third-person description of their actual properties. And so it's much easier to find people to, partake in to participate in research who do actively identify as asexual than it is to find people who might possibly Uh, we've got time for one more question, if anyone has any or thoughts or comments, if you so desire. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, with the, obviously you talked about categories and how they seem to be sort of um, expanding, well, sort of expanding to contracting at once, so you, sort of the views are narrower but there's more of them. Um, do you think we'll ever reach a point, or whether it would be useful to reach a point where there are no categories, there's just a personal 
like this is just the way you act. Uh, no, I, I don't. I'm, um, I, I, you know, I like to say quite, you know, categorically, I, um, <laughs> that that is fundamentally impossible um, because with language using animals, um, this need for categories comes partly from our reliance on language, both internally and externally, to articulate ourselves, and also from the fact that we live in a social world and part of living in society that's not uniform, that's not homogenous, is the need to give an account of yourself. And so I think categories will, will never go away. The categories might become much, much, much looser, much more pragmatic, but I don't think they'll go away.